presentation layer, on the other hand, has to then read the output of the logger bolt, read the relevant output of the Hadoop jobs, combine the semi-aggregated jobs, like add up 7,000 records or something like that for the last hour, hour and a half, or almost two hours. And users will see counters that increment every second or two, and they'll not be able to see any gap between the real time and the long time. The, the presentation layer looks roughly like this. You know, we, one of the places that this has come up is in uh, mobile phones. These talk every 30 seconds. They talk to a tower that's nearby and a tower that's not so nearby. And so there's a whole crap load, that's a technical term, of these messages coming in at any given moment. And the mobile operators would like to know within a few seconds when a tower goes down so that they can reroute and respond and also dispatch a team. Now, dispatching a team is not within seconds, but they'd like to know within minutes because very often there is a maintenance team very close to the tower. So this is an example of where this exact thing is needed. So we have lots of ingestion servers. We have the storm network there. And we have Hadoop over there. And we get transaction data coming in there. We have the storm plus batch aggregation going into the, the long-term persistence. And then the dashboard looks at both sides. And in fact, this side is rooted on the same storage as the HBase anyway, so that it's all, all the same sort of thing. Any questions on that first example? It makes sense once you, once you go through it, but it certainly isn't the way I started doing this, uh, this sort of project. Uh, counting is never as easy as it looks. I'm a professional. And I do statistics for a living, and counting is hard. <laughs> it's always the hardest part of the job. The math is the easy part. No question. So here's a second example. And this one uses a bit more um, math. It uses a bit more processing. But in fact, the topology winds up a little bit simpler. So what I want to do is I want to build a model that builds an estimate of how things are responding. These things might be ads that get click-throughs. They might be alternative versions of landing pages that get you know, conversions. They might be different designs for a website from the, the back-end design options that we're experimenting with, rolling out a new kind of database, rolling out a new presentation layer, all of these sorts of things, rolling out new presentation designs. Uh, all of these sorts of things can use this sort of real-time learning and the idea is that the model has to decide what it wants to find out and learn about what the response is at the same time. It's not like we're going to gather data for a while, we're going to go away, and we're going to start up R, and we're going to build a model, we'll come back, let you know. No, this is all in real time. We don't know which data we want to pick because picking the wrong data, showing the wrong version of the landing site, showing the wrong non-functional website costs money. Data is, is worth money in these cases. Showing the suboptimal thing costs us money. On the other hand, not showing it when we don't know about it also costs us money because it might be better. So the same real-time model has to make both decisions, has to learn about things, and then it has to decide what it wants to learn about. And as an example of where this really matters, one of the key models in advertising is deciding whether somebody will click on anything, or if they're just you know, a termagant and they're not gonna click on anything at all. The reason that that's important is if you don't show them ads, the people who will not click under any circumstances, your average click-through goes up. And the ads that you're presenting appear to be much more valuable to the advertiser. They ask, what's your click-through? Not, how many things can I get clicked on and what will I pay for that? They ask, what's your click-through? And if you can say a higher number, say twice as high, you really look like a genius. Now, you also do other things. You train users to see ads. Nothing, nothing, nothing. What, what is that? Oh, dang, I didn't mean to look at that. So if you cannot present ads when they will do no good, 
then when you do, they're a novelty, and people are more likely to click on them. So this is a, a lesson that Google learned before Yahoo, to Yahoo's detriment, but Yahoo did learn it eventually. And they built, finally, a real-time system, system to do click learning. And they cut the delay time from six hours to a few minutes on the click learning, the clicker, not clicker learning. And according to a published paper, that made two or three percent difference in revenue to Yahoo. Note the lack of qualifiers. Overall, that made two or three percent revenue difference to Yahoo, which means that the part of Yahoo that did this one small hack of cutting this in to real time was responsible for a huge difference in terms of what they were normal handling. And so this is a real problem and an important one. So as I said, I'm going to show a simplified version where we have, say, 15 versions of the landing page. Each Vista is assigned a version. The first question is which version? A conversion or sale happens or it does not. How long do we wait? Some versions of the landing page are horrible. We want to not show them. Soon, hopefully. Very soon. We don't want to wait for a total experimental period and then make a decision about everything because we'll learn about some things faster than other things. We have real-time constraints. Uh, 20 milliseconds is probably very generous. I'm sure that people who are really doing this would much rather see two milliseconds in that sort of thing. 20 I do just because I wouldn't know if this sort of design really could be pushed. You'd have a lot of real optimization to do. Training events will come in asynchronously. So you, you get, here, make a decision now. But I'm not going to tell you the answer for another couple of minutes or hours. So the training data will come in much later. So you have to deal with that delay. Failover, hey, better be fast, because this is serious money in there. And related to that, the client, client should time out and then back off if it has repeated timeouts. There's no need, uh, therefore, for the, uh, the, the, frame, the framework to, after five seconds of timeout, replay those transactions, because the user's gone by then. It's too late. So we just discard those on failures. And of course, we need to persist this state, because if a node goes down, we can't forget the state of our valuable model that's hopefully making the difference to us of 2% of Yahoo's revenues. Probably won't make quite that much difference, but hopefully it would. So rough design. We have a selector layer, some sort of ad service layer uh, connected to a web thing, coming into a DRPC spout. We have a timed join there. It's going to buffer impressions and immediately pass those on to the model for a selection return result. And it's also then going to buffer them so that conversions coming in can be matched up to the impressions. And then we can send training data at the end of an aging period. We have to wait a constant amount for all impressions to see if they convert, because we can't wait a short time for some and a long time for other without introducing bias. So we wait a certain amount of time. If conversions have come in, then we pass a positive training result in. If they have not, we pass a negative training result in to the model. The model, of course, then persists occasionally in state, and it acknowledges things so that we know we're done with those. Now, the, the DRPC spout in this case can be adjusted, so it does not actually need to retransmit things. If things time out, too bad. See ya. We'll be back. And of course, we want to log a fair bit of data into raw things. Now, let's take a, a minor diversion. What is probability? This is philosophy, not engineering. If I have a coin, I have a couple of coins. So if I have a coin, what's the prob not that one. What's the probability that it comes up heads? What? Half. Half. Why do you say that? What do you know about this coin? You do know something. It has two sides. And presumably, they're different. But even if they're the same, you don't know what they are, both of them. So you say half. In a state of ignorance, you say a half. OK, I'm about to flip it. Do you still give the same answer? Yes. OK, I flipped it and, and gladly caught it. Do you give the same answer? I look at it. Do you still give the same answer? 
Will I give the same answer? No. What's the difference? What difference is there? It's the same coin, same species. <laughs> the only difference is I looked at my hand and he didn't look at his hand, my hand. He may have looked at his hand, but not mine. So what's the difference? You have more information. Yeah. So he says probability, and you say information, and I say they're the same thing. As, as humans use the term, certainly, and as certain mathematicians use it, probability is a statement of ignorance. He says probably half, you know, half probability, and that's saying, well, I don't know. Now, you're not saying that it has to be exactly half through there. It could be alt heads, it could be all tails, right? You're just saying you don't know. So, probability is information. That's, that's one thought. And a single number, I forced him to say half. You may have to, to collapse all of the knowledge about the coin <coughs> into a single number, and he gave the best single number he could, but in fact, he probably had in his head, why does this guy have so friggin' many coins in his pocket? That's weird. So weird has a significant chance of being true. So it's probably 50-50 coin, but it might be both heads, might be both tails. I've heard of more all heads coins, so that's probably a little higher. So he probably had in his head, in that tiny moment I gave him, a weird peaked distribution of which way it's gonna come up. So a distribution might be better. If he really meant to say, I don't know, then he could be saying, it's all equal. From zero to one probability, it's all the same to him. Now, if I were to flip this thing 10 times, five heads, five tails, he might be a bit more willing to say, it's in the middle, but he still wouldn't trust me because I had a whole crap load of coins in my pocket. And I've got still more, you know, so he's not going to trust me. But he knows it's not all tails, and he knows it's not all heads. So he's learned something. If it came up two heads and ten tails, then he would be pushing it this way. But he still wouldn't say zeros. So this idea is, in a nutshell, Bayesian inference. The idea is that in your head, until you're forced to collapse the waveform and say a single number, you have in your head a distribution. And using that distribution is, in fact, in this case, a more powerful way to solve this problem. So if I'm going to make you pick one coin or the other, interestingly, this algorithm, where we do not use our best estimate, so here, back here, what's the best estimate of the probability of heads. It's an average somewhere down here at about one-sixth, right? 